Hi, my name is Rebecca Bryant, and uh, I'm a senior program officer with OCLC Research. Uh, and I'm going to be joined by Jan Franson and Anna Clements. Um, we're two member, three members of a team that's been working uh, for the last year and a half uh, to do a study on uh, research information practices worldwide. And I'm, we're going to give you some preliminary information uh, and tell you about an upcoming report. So the overview today is to, to talk about our collaboration um, to provide you with some sort of initial findings from the survey that we did uh, and to help you understand sort of what our goals for this study were. So um, I come from OCLC, uh, which is for those of you who work in libraries, with libraries as a familiar organization. Um, I am specifically in sort of the membership nonprofit sort of component of OCLC, which for the last 40 years has conducted research on behalf of the library community to help scale that knowledge and learning. So my job is to investigate emerging practices in scholarly communication for, um, for libraries and for universities writ large. Um, you can follow what we're doing, you know, look more, you know, we, we do a lot of research related to activities for libraries. All of our research is always public and open access, and you can also follow our blog. So since I joined OCLC um, about two and a half years ago, we've developed an arc of research related to research information management. Uh, and so we've had a couple reports, and I have a couple print copies if anyone's interested, related to better understanding research information management. Um, and um, because we use a lot of different terminologies, and especially you have sort of a clash between our practices in North America and practices in Europe and Australia. We use different terminologies, we have different goals. Uh, and our goal has been sort of with the, the first report is to, to better understand that landscape, to see the similarities, and so we can sort of have some, some ways to better understand that. Also to understand how libraries are functioning within this landscape uh, and um, to articulate that to some extent. Um, we've done some additional research that's specific to um, continental Europe and better understanding what's the adoption of persistent identifiers like ORCID as well as sort of organizational identifiers within CRIS systems. And then this survey has been a partnership between OCLC and the EuroCRIS organization. Um, we will be publishing this report at the end of this month. It will be available open access. And I'll also add that we will be publishing the, data, the accompanying data set. So um, we've you know, in our report are talking about sort of the most relevant things, but we don't discuss everything that may be revealed in the data set. So if you wanted to take it and do additional research, that's our contribution to the community. Okay, so, um, so I'm joining Rebecca now. I'm Anna Clements, um, and I'm Assistant Director of Library Services at the University of St. Andrews, um, but I'm also a board member of Eurochris, um, and some of you may know of Eurochris and be a member of Eurochris. This is an organization which um, is based in Europe but has members across all continents actually, including some members in North America, Australia, China and so on. Most of the members are in Europe. Um, there are over 200, nearly 200 members and we have 15 strategic partners, one of whom is OCLC and, and this, um, the product, this, this um, survey is a product of, of that um, strategic partnership. What Eurochris does um, is we, are, are we share best practice of research information management um, systems and procedures. We call them CRIS systems in Europe, as Rebecca has uh, uh, referred to. Um, and we also uh, manage and promote, maintain the open standard, um, Sarif standard, which um, I was very pleased to see that Davina put up a, 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 um, a slide um, outlining that Sarif standard yesterday in the roadmap. And it's also very encouraging that we're working with Elsevier and OpenAir on the Sarif XML compliance. Um, so that will be shortly um, being released in, in Pure, so it's great. My own background in terms of um, why I'm interested in, in this area, so Eurochris, the open standards and so on, and I'm sure some of you will know this, that I'm very interested in interoperability and open standards and ensuring that researchers enter the data once and it's reused in many places. And I think 
those of us who have been using Pure for many years uh, are pleased that this is, it, this is happening more and more. So the, I think that's probably what I, all I wanted to say about um, Eurochris at the moment. There was one other thing, no, I think one other thing was that we, Eurochris, did do a survey um, in collaboration with UNIS, which is the European um, uh, IT service um, organisation, in 2015, where we um, looked more at CRIS IR interoperability in that survey. I think we had 80 responses from 20 countries, and I'm pleased to say we had significantly more in this survey, which our, 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 um, um, Rebecca will be talking about um, in the next few slides. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna set up a little bit before we get to some of the results. So again, we're gonna be publishing this report in November. We've had a lot of collaborators from OCLC, from members of the OCLC Research Library Partnership, that includes Dan and, and Anna as well, and then partnership with, with folks from, um, from Eurochris. Uh, definitely a collaborative research project. So in the next you know, half hour, hour or so, we're, these, are, these are just a few of the things we're gonna talk about from the survey. We're gonna talk about the incentives and some of the regional differences there. We're gonna talk about the ways that institutions are using their REM or CRIS systems, um, as well as some of the regional distinctions there. We ask a lot of questions related to interoperability, how much, what do you need? Um, we were very interested in who are the stakeholders that are participating on campus. OCLC in particular is very interested in the role of the library. Uh, and finally, we're gonna wrap up by talking about the use of persistent identifiers within CRIS systems. So some background, we launched the survey about a year ago in, with English and Spanish versions. We had it open for about a quarter uh, and um, we promoted the survey um, through our own networks. So Eurochris and OCLC both worked to promote the survey. We reached out to organizations uh, like Elsevier and other user group communities to help promote the survey. Uh, and I, I will clarify that this is a descriptive survey. It's, you know, we didn't have, we, we really, there's a lot that none of us know <laughs> about this landscape. So we reached out and we were interested in anyone who would be willing to share information with us. And we intend to repeat this survey at intervals so that we can build more knowledge about this. Uh, but again, our, our information is very descriptive. There are um, we had 381 survey responses from 44 countries. Um, in some countries, like from the Netherlands or the UK, I think we had quite representative samples. But if you look from the United States, um, we had 39 responses, and then when you break that down to the number of institutions that have systems that are live, um, those numbers actually sort of go down. That's not quite, a, that's not a representative sample. Um, Combining this, though, with some of our qualitative research, we often still are going to be describing this. We've chosen to reveal those, um, despite some of, some of the limitations that we, we want to express. So we had 222 institutions that reported having live systems, live RIM or CRIS systems. And that's where most of our research report will be focusing. Um, one of the first things here, and we have two or three slides here specific to pure users, um, of, of 193 responses to what RIM system are you using, 30% reported using Pure, followed closely by 28% using some type of in-house, homegrown type system. And then you can see other types of systems coming down from that. Little hard to see, probably if you're in the back, what I wanna point out is this left blue is pure. And then we, you know, we have sort of other systems. What we can see is that, um, you know, not surprisingly, pure is used sort of worldwide. You see some other systems, you know, like um, the open source profiles RNS system, you know, sort of represented here, US, Canada, but then sort of absent in other places. So some of the things that we can reveal is, is sort of the geographic distribution of systems. And then here were the, the countries that responded that they are using pure systems. So 11 from the United Kingdom, seven from the US, uh, six from the Netherlands, and on up for many that were just sort of one system. 
And I think this may be where I turn it over to Dan. <laughs> we put dots on our slides so we know when we were talking. Uh, my name is Jan Franson. I'm from the University of Minnesota, and I'm the service lead for research information management systems in university libraries. So we uh, administer Pure through the libraries. We do it for the um, most, all of the Twin Cities campus, which is our largest campus, and we'll be adding the rest of the system as well. Um, so when I got involved with this, I was really interested. I, I had been to the Berlin conference two years ago, and I'd really seen a lot of regional differences and differences in why people were using Pure, uh, differences from what we had, we had how, the, how we'd made the decision, and also just in general between different participants. So I was very interested in this question that we had about the incentives. Why did you start using a RIM system? And I'm sure you can't read this, but I put these in the slides just so you could see the context of how the question was asked. Um, but here's the results that, that, um, that we saw. Oops, I'm sorry, I thought, oh, maybe I'm not, I don't have the same slides I thought I did. Okay, so the uh, um, reasons for pursuing is, is here, and you can see at the top, the first reason is managing academic activity reporting, and that's well over half of the people. Uh, we don't use it for activity reporting in the sense of promotion and tenure, but certainly there's a lot of use of, of uh, Pure as, and other systems like it as a way of, of uh, reporting out um, what our faculty are doing. Uh, but if you look down a little bit further, you'll see some of the others. Uh, supporting expertise discovery rates down there near the bottom. Um, the, it's going um, extremely important is the light blue, important is the dark blue, and so on down the line. Uh, that was actually our primary reason for getting a, a, a RIM system. So uh, it was intriguing to see that down near the bottom. Uh, this mixes things up a little bit, but another uh, influence, another thing that people use the system for uh, the external research assessment workflows. So that for the U.S. and Canada was far less important relative to what we saw for uh, the U.K. and for Australia, thinking as we just saw in the previous presentation in this room about some of the institutional exercises that, that need to be done and reported out at a country level. Similarly, here's that expertise discovery broken out by a country. And there we see Peru and United States, where it's relatively important. And then looking down the line, it becomes less and less important down to Australia and the Netherlands, down near the bottom there. Now, as Rebecca said, there are a lot of caveats with these data. They're really just kind of an indication of more questions that we think need to be asked. But we do have a few little in, uh, summary items to make note of here. Um, what, from what we saw in this data and kind of our observations previously, we really think the U.S. has been kind of an outlier up to this point as far as how we in the U.S. are making use of these systems relative to others. Uh, we don't have the national compliance uh, requirements that are common in so many other places. And in the beginning, we had a lot of emphasis within the U.S. on research networking systems. One of the earliest systems that we saw at our institution was Harvard Profiles. We had that before we had Cyval Experts and, and then Pure. And it was about that networking aspect. Also, in this survey, we had a very low response from a couple of the communities that we would have expected more from, uh, uh, with more emphasis on that side from Profiles RNS and Vivo. Uh, so we'll be trying to build that up the next time. The, uh, for the next survey, research question, uh, will incentives for new adopters of RIM shift away from compliance and towards expertise discovery, thinking that many of the institutions who need it for that kind of compliance, they've already got it. So people who are now coming into this, uh, to this type of product, are they coming in for different reasons? So that's something we'll be looking at. Um, this is a, the, the parallel question. We asked two questions. First, what motivated you to get a system, a room system? And the second question, what are you finding that you're using it for? And again, at my own institution, we have found that we've shifted from how, why we first got that system to what we're doing with it now, six years later. We gave people a bunch of different choices here. And this gives you a quick summary. Again, we've had them sorted sort of vaguely by what was the most popular. Up at the top, the registry of uh, institutional research outputs, and way down at the bottom, reporting societal impact. 
Not that it's not important, it's just not one of the most important things. Um, and again, we can see some differences split out by, uh, by the, the region, US and Canada. Um, is circled up there at the top. Uh, this is Registry of Institutional Research Outputs. And I don't think I have it circled here. Compliance and open access to publications. Again, not terribly important in the US and Canada, much more important at, in other places. The UK right there below it on the, on the list. This one is alphabetical. Uh, we see uh, that it's very important there. Um, this is open access to data sets, and I think this may be an example on the next survey of something else that we see a shift in as far as importance. Right now, the publications, very important. The data sets, perhaps growing in importance, and that's, that's what we are perceiving, at least, um, at our institution, that that is becoming more of something that we want to keep track of and make sure people are uh, putting things in, even though we don't have a national compliance mandate yet. Uh, as others do, we do see the importance growing. Oops. Sorry. Um, so, yes, for most, the RIM is, is a valuable registry. Um, for all, most institutions that we saw, there are multiple uses going on. They might have had one motivation for starting. That may still be a motivation to keep using it, but other things have become more obvious as time has gone on. Uh, we'll be really interested to look in another year or two years when we do this survey again to see again how that shifts over time. And I'll turn it over to Anna. So back to my favorite topic about interoperability, and, and we looked at several aspects of interoperability. Um, the first being the which internal and external systems um, the RIM systems interoperate with. I think. Most of these probably aren't surprising. Um, we're concentrating, obviously, on the, the um, RIM systems that are live rather than those that are, that are sort of being planned. So these is actually what's happening at the moment. So on the left-hand side, um, you can see the internal systems. So within Pure, this is the systems that um, you would synchronize with. So we obviously have the HR system at the top there, um, institutional authentication systems, um, very similar as well in terms of percentages, um, and re repository um, systems and student information systems, all very high. We're, I'm going to, in the next few slides, talk a little bit more about the um, repository system interoperation as well, because we have the, the sort of um, difference between using um, the RIM system or your CRIS system as your repository and, and interoperating with an existing system like DSpace or ePrints, and that's quite interesting to look at. On the right-hand side, we have the external systems, um, and obviously at the top there, we've got the publication metadata sources, and again, there'll be a slide a bit further up down uh, along which, which shows which, which different um, sources are the most popular. Um, it's quite encouraging to look at the, the next one down, the 65%, so the researcher and author ID registry database, so that would be ORCID, for example. So that's quite encouraging to see that over 65% of the systems in production at the moment are integrating with those. And then we go further down into metric systems and, and reporting systems and so on. So if we look at the publication metadata sources, I think there have been quite a few um, sessions already about in, um, synchronizing or scanning of publication metadata sources. There's probably a few more to come as well. Um, and how well or, or otherwise that these work. But um, it's, it's interesting, I think, probably not surprising, the top one scopus, uh, we have websites, we have PubMed. Those, so those are the three top sources across the piece. Further down, there are some more um, interesting sources as well in terms of, um, so I think, can I get this? Yeah. Um, so what we always get um, from our arts and humanities scholars is, okay, Pure is fantastic for journal articles and conference proceedings and so on, but what about us poor scholars who produce books and book chapters and so on? Where can we get the data from? Now, obviously, they don't, um, publish so many outputs, but equally, I think we all have uh, a need to try and work with them. So it was quite interesting that, that there are some people using WorldCat um, to bring in information. There's also Google book, Books as well. Um, so it will be interesting to see whether that increases when we do the next survey, um, and also um, whether more information is coming into some of the bigger databases that are indexing um, outputs of different kinds to see if that um, 
increases. So looking, going back then to interoperability with institutional repositories. So here, well, no, we'll first look, sorry, we'll first look at whether your RIM system or your CRIS system serves as your, as your default repository. What we've done here is we asked the question, um, oh, is it going to work? Oh, no, here we are. Okay, so we've asked the question about, does your RIM system serve as your default, your institutional repository, so that's your publications, your a thesis repository or your research data repository. So here we can see that um, more, so over, over half are using their RIM system, their CRIS system as their repository. Um, just over a third are using it for their thesis repository and about a quarter using it for their research data repository. Um, so we, I, we then looked at the figure for Pure, and the figures are fairly similar for Pure. So 58% are using it as the default repository. Um, interestingly, these two, so the thesis and the research data repository are, uh, are similar, so 29% for each. So um, that was quite interesting to see that. The breakdown, I think, which is more interesting, I find anyway, is the breakdown by region. So, which probably helps, um, we, can, we can maybe uh, draw some conclusions from this. So here, we, the blue here, the light blue is Europe, this, this um, bar here. Then we have the, the USA, Canada, we have Australia, and we, we have all the others. But if we look at uh, the difference between, say, Europe and the US in terms of um, the responses, it's quite, it's quite, it is quite different. Um, and I think that goes back to perhaps in, in Europe a longer history of, um, of um, repository, of, sorry, going back to the US, a longer history of using repositories, perhaps, I'm not sure. But it's so interesting, I think, in the thesis side that there's none, none of the um, institutions in the US or Canada um, are using their RIM system as their default th thesis repository. So I don't know whether that is symptomatic of whether the, the, the libraries or um, the research office aren't working so closely together with each other in the US and Canada as they are as in Europe. That's a question that I think is, is an interesting one to ask. Um, and then looking at the other side of the coin, so instead of using your RIM system as your default repository for the different content types, what about if you're using it to interoperate with separate repositories? So for example, in in, in my institution in St Andrews, we had a, have a, and still do have a DSpace repository, which we had established before we had our, our pure CRIS system, um, and we've kept that and we've linked to it, and we have our, we we use the um, connector to, to connect to that, and I think that's in the UK that's quite common, but equally um, I think in the UK it's probably 50/50 between using your RIM system as your repository and interoperating. So, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Where did I get? Yeah, okay. So here we have overall, so this is the overall figures, um, so across all regions, so across the however many um, live instances that, that reported back, 43% are interoperating, um, have an in, their RIM system interoperating with their institutional repository, 15% with their data repository, and 20% with their, their um, thesis uh, repository. And again, as Jan pointed out, it will be interesting to see how those figures change when we run the, the survey again in a few years' time. So, this again is the information which is broken down by region. So, effectively, if you're interoperating, um, there's an interoperation between the CRIS system and your repository, whether it's your institutional repository, your data repository, and your thesis repository, how does that change between Europe, which is the light blue, Aust um, USA and Canada, which is the darker blue, and Australia here in, in the, I don't know what color that is, the red, okay? And again, if we look at the research data repository and the thesis repository side, we have nothing from the USA and Canada, which again is quite interesting. Um, the, Europe and um, Australia are quite similar in, in, in what's happening, um, but um, the USA and Canada is, is quite different. I think it's fair to say 
and Rebecca did mention this, I think we didn't get a representative response from the US. So I think what we, one of the things that we would want to try and encourage is, is, is um, for the next survey is more, more people to respond from all the different regions as well so we can get a better representative um, response. So leaving aside now, moving on from the um, interoperability with institution repositories and so on, we then asked about protocols and standards that um, people were aware of that their systems supported. So at the top here, we have OAI PMH, which is not surprising because that's obviously a standard um, protocol that's used by repositories for making metadata available. Um, and that's also available in many, most, uh, most CRIS systems or RIM systems. It was encouraging from my point of view, being a board member of Eurochris as well, to, to see that many, uh, well, 40% um, of the live RIM um, in institutions responding um, were aware that Serif or Serif XML was important as well, it was an open standard <coughs> with respect to their, their RIM system. And again, this ties back to what's um, the roadmap yesterday and the release of the open air um, uh, integration with using Serif XML that um, Davina mentioned, so it's great to see that. Shibboleth, this is obviously for single sign-on and so on. Um, and then we have various other standards. Um, there's a CASRI Kaz here is mentioned, which some of you may, may be aware of. So CASRI is an organization that started in Canada, but it has um, chapters now in the Europe and, and sorry, in, yeah, in Europe and in the UK. Um, and one of the key things that has come out of, of CASRI is a standard definition for um, author con contributor um, uh, types so it's the credit taxonomy which is used by nature and various other um, journals and so on so that's quite an interesting um, standard and it's also something that I, I think pure should look at, at in terms of contributor roles against uh, outputs because um, it helps a any particular um, contributor to any type of author uh, sorry any type of output ensure that they are um, they get the right um, contribution um, acknowledgement to their outputs, and that's becoming more and more, more important, I think, for different types of outputs. So we're moving away from publications, data sets, and so on. I think that's important, and software, I think, as well. So just some summary si findings. Then we've obviously found a, high, a fairly high degree of, of interoperability with many systems, and particularly uh, institutional repositories. There are, I, I didn't point out actually, but in the, in the, the slide where we looked at some of the internal um, systems interoperability. There are quite a few of uh, the RIM systems across the piece that are integrating with workflows for funding information as well. And again, that's an area which I think will grow. Um, so information that's coming from funders into, um, into RIM systems, I think it will be interesting to see how that increases over, over the period. Um, obviously, we all, I think, if we're using a, a pure or probably any other RIM system, we are... Um, leveraging, we're, we're bringing in um, publications metadata from many different sources, which is, is great. And the other thing I think is, is to recognize that the OAI, PMH and Serif XML um, are important standards that um, the RIM systems do um, comply with. So just briefly, I'm gonna, a couple of slides on stakeholders because I was interested, so working in the library, I'm assistant director at the library, in St Andrews, I'm quite interested in understanding um, where libraries are placed in, in, in stakeholders of, of RIM systems. We know from what Pure can do and other, other RIM systems can do, then you can't just leave it to one part of the institution really to manage and organize. Um, you have to work across the piece. You have to work with the different areas of the university to make it successful. So, and I think with the advent in Europe in particular, the open access policies and open data policies, I think the library has, has found quite a, quite a hev high voice or a, a prominent voice in managing and um, uh, helping manage RIM systems. So it was very interesting for us to find, to, to ask the questions um, and to find out. So here, the basic question we asked, we listed 14 different speci specific RIM activities and then just asked, well, where's the primary responsibility and, pe and people could choose more than one so this is um, the number of mentions for each so the pale blue is for the primary role for a, any particular rim activity and the darker blue is the secondary role 
not surprisingly, the research office had the most mentions for the primary role against um, the RIM activities. But the library was reasonably cl close in terms of um, being second highest. And then we had the IT people, we had the provost and the chancellor, which was quite interesting and, and encouraging, actually. And then we have the academic units, which in some ways is not surprising, but it's a bit disappointing. And I think, as we saw yesterday in the presentation about the user interface, and it was a surprise to me the figures that Henrik presented and just how many, how what percentage of the logins to Pure are personal users. And I think sometimes we as administrators or of Pure forget that. Um, so it's interesting that there is some um, some of the responses, and we'll, we'll look at it in country, by country in a minute, which is quite interesting, did say that the um, ac ac academic units were, um, did have a primary role in certain func functionalities, so certain functions. So this, this is looking at breaking that data down by region again. Um, and this, I think, helps show you um, where there are differences. And I was particularly interested I'll just show you quickly. So we, we've ordered it in, in a sort of priority, the library. So the library in, in the Netherlands, so the library has the highest primary, primary responsibility um, selection here um, with, I think it's, fifth, I can't see, 50%, is it? Or well, not quite. Um, and then we have the US and Canada and we have the UK. So this is the library, the pale blue. The darker blue is the um, academic units. And this one, the purple, if you like, or the crimson, whatever, is the um, research office, which is broadly the largest, well, the largest in many of the regions, not all of them, though. And I think particularly it's the Netherlands is interesting, and I'm quite keen to understand. I have some, some thought why this might be the case, but the Netherlands, we have quite a high proportion of um, responses saying that the academic units are primarily um, responsible for a certain role. Now, whether that's because of the history in the Netherlands, so they've had um, METIS and NARSIS and various systems for some time, and, and I think they must have worked very closely with their researchers. Um, but it's interesting to see that coming through. Um, as far as the, the US and Canada is concerned, um, then I'm not sure, I suppose there we've got the significant thing, perhaps, is that the research office isn't um, as important to say as the, as the library. But we'll be interested, I think, that if we can get more data to be able to delve into that. So those are my two slides on um, the stakeholders. So I'll pass back to Rebecca to finish off on persistent identifiers. Thank you. So we're you know, very interested in the role that persistent identifiers play in um, metadata harvesting and improving the quality of our metadata and in improving the ability to move data between systems. Uh, so we ask institutions, what uh, persistent identifiers are you using? In this slide, you can see responses related to person or researcher identifiers. Uh, and you can see 73% of institutions with a live REM system report using ORCID in, to some degree, um, followed by the Scopus identifier it's for 60%. Um, uh, I think that this represents, you know, ORCID really becoming the de facto standard within the CRIS or REM ecosystem for, for use. Um, and we also asked about organizational identifiers. Um, rather expecting that we would get this result, that they're really not used, there's a lot of interest. Um, we, we sort of weren't surprised by this, but we also wanted to ask it as a baseline, because when we repeat the survey, my hope at least is that we see some change in this landscape, because there is a lot of need to link persons to publications, to organizations, to funders, to grant numbers. And so I think that there's a, a lot of interest related to that. This is also congruent with some qualitative research that OCLC research did in conjunction with the European Association of Research Libraries, LIBER, uh, where we did qualitative study looking at the adoption of person and organizational identifiers in the Netherlands, Germany, and Finland. Uh, and so 
our, our, our findings from both qualitative and quantitative research have in this finding sort of reinforced each other. Uh, so that's, that's our presentation. I think we have time now for about 10 minutes of questions. That's right. Um, and again, the report will be published in November. Um, everything that we've, we've talked about related to our research is available at this short URL, oc.lc backslash rim. So you can take a look there. Um, follow Twitter, follow our blog hanging together through OCLC research. Um, follow, yeah, just um, we'll be, or follow your Chris, because we'll all be promoting this. And I think we're going to be launching um, the survey in conjunction with a strategic partners meeting at the end of this month with your Chris in Warsaw. So thank you. Okay. I was going to give the first question to our online audience, but we don't have any yet, so I'm going to remind them again. We've got a few people online, so please submit your questions to the Ask a Question feature if you have them. Uh, but let's open it up to the room. We have 10 minutes before our coffee break, uh, so plenty of time for questions. Two here. Fastest hand, I think, went to Ruth, but uh, it doesn't matter. So thank you very much for this, and I mean, it's incredibly interesting what you've pulled together, and the future surveys are really gonna be telling to see what kinds of changes there are. A question for you is, um, what was uh, sort of like the biggest surprise that you encountered in the results, or perhaps there was more than one that you really weren't expecting, or were there, were there any? a stumping hard question Ruth um, we I think we sort of quickly agreed here that it's probably the findings with the repositories um, it's something I think that you know, at least to sort of in my qualitative research it's sort of observed um, there's I think there's still a lot we don't know but but we sense that there's some I would say drivers for improved workflows for researchers. Um, that's definitely driving um, some changes in this space. Um, I'm gonna be very interested to see how this, you know, because we see a lot of institutions, uh, especially in the UK and the Netherlands, that seem to be using um, Pure or, or some other product as their repository. Um, and, and I think largely for workflow interests. Um, yeah, I think that's exceptionally interesting and um, you know, we will see where that goes. Yeah. Anything else from you? Yeah. Just, just to add to that as well, I think there was some, in terms of the way we uh, uh, worded the questions, there was still some confusion by some people answering. So, for example, from Italy, um, I think all the or most of the Italian universities use a product that was produced by Chinica, which is basically D Space Chris. Now, in the previous. Um, survey that we did with um, Eurochris and Eunice, they had all answered that they have a, D, a, a, a RIM system that interoperates with a repository. In this particular survey, they said that they use their CRIS as their repository, but they're using the same software. The only difference is that that software is now hosted in the cloud. So, you know, so there's, I think there's, that was quite, I said, we say that's a surprise. That's probably given us something to think about for the next survey to try and ensure that we can tease out these things and, and get, get the correct results or, or ensure that people understand the questions as well. The other big thing that we, we did learn from it, didn't we, was that we should make the, the question about country mandatory. Because <laughs> we, 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 yeah, we, and first, yeah, because we were, we were designing it just about um, when the GDPR regulations were being launched in, in Europe, and I'm sure everybody's heard of GDPR. If, if you haven't, then I'm sure some of us can tell you. But we were really worried about getting anything about, you know, about personal data or, or data protection and so on. So that meant we had, I can't remember how many, it was about 100 or so, there are 381 responses where we didn't know what the country was, which obviously that's why on se several of the slides you see this big, bar chart bar which is for other so next time we're going to make it a mandatory question <laughs> i think i've got one more <laughs> this is uh it's 
similarly, this is more not really in the results per se, but just thinking about how wh what our mindset was when we were first writing the questions, and we spent a lot of time getting the wording right, making sure that it would work from one country to the next, and that sort of thing. And I think that in the end, the way we wrote the survey was more product-centric than I think we would do if we were doing it again today. Um, it seemed like as we got responses, you know, we, we asked questions like, what, what, what system did you implement first? What did you implement? If you implemented something else, what did you do second? And I think that there is maybe a little bit more of multiple systems working together in sort of an ecosystem <laughs> rather than any one particular product that does it all. And I think next time we may try to account for that a little bit more. Thank you. I think next question was here. Um, good morning. My question is about um, the organizational identifier. Um, and Rebecca, you mentioned that you weren't surprised by the results that you got from the survey and that you were hoping for a change the next time you conduct the survey. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions um, what those of us working at institutions might be able to do to help effect those changes that you're hoping for. Um. There's currently, so the, there, um, there are organizational identifiers. They're largely not used in scholarly communications and tend not to have maybe the degree of uh, API usage that's sort of necessary. Um, and um, there has been efforts um, that many of you may know about that are being led by ORCID, DataCite, and Crossref uh, related to um, a new organizational identifier that, like ORCID, is sort of intended to be plumbing uh, within the landscape. Uh, and um, I actually previously worked for ORCID and understand that there's sort of a lot of needs for um, improved assertions from organizations and you really need sort of some improved op interoperability there. Um, ORCID frequently reports on this, so if you follow their blog, you can do this. Um, there's a Pitapalooza event, it's in Dublin, Ireland, not Dublin, Ohio, where I live, uh, and that's in January. I think that that's a way to track that. Um, and I think there's a lot of interest also coming from the funders as well. Anna, would you add anything to that? What I could add is this is a pure conference. It would be great if pure could, um, by default, allow some of these standard identifiers for institutions, organizations like GRID, uh, ISNI, and so on, not just the Elsevier ones, which is what we have at the moment. Point taken. Um, yeah, hi. I'm, can, I, can we go back to the term um, primary responsibility again for a second? And sorry if that was explained. But the way that I interpreted that, I mean, it, you could look at that a few ways. It could be financial responsibility. It could be looked at as day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I, I'm sorry if you actually did explain how the question was worded, because I'm at Penn State, and if it weren't for uh, the vice president for research paying for it, the, a number of no. players wouldn't be involved down the road. So I'm just kind of wondering if we could go back to what that question, how that question is worded. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. This is just a summary. There are 14 different specific ring at, rim activities. So, th for example, one of them is financial, right? So they were asked for each of the 14 ones. So this is just an aggregated slide over all of them. So in the report and the data we release, it will be quite clear. Um, okay, so sorry if I didn't explain that very well, but that, yeah, okay, okay, but I mean, we can probably show you the data anyway if you're interested, we've got that, okay. Yeah, I, think it'll be quite, okay. I think it'll be quite interesting to see the, yeah. the breakdown of yeah. where, uh, especially geographic differences on some of those yeah. uh, key responsibilities. Yeah. Okay. Another question from the audience? Still have one minute until your coffee break, so. Let me do a quick check online. Oh, we do have something online. Aha, online question. Uh, what do you think the difference is between the US and Canada results compared to the rest of the world might mean for the development of Pure? I'm guessing this might be more related to the repository question. Uh, 
how to start. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. If, uh, if it were me, I think I would be not thinking so much about what the next thing that gets developed is. I would be thinking more in terms of the, the language used as, we, uh, as, as the, the Pure team talks about new enhancements coming forward. And maybe they are targeted to a specific market. We all have different needs based on not only our, our countries, but also just our institutions, the type of institution we're at. Um, but when something new is coming out, perhaps this is why we're doing this, and here are other ways it could be used. I think that might be more than do this function over that function. I think just to add to that, I think again going back to the figures that Henrik had yesterday about um, logins to Pure, and when he showed a breakdown um, by country, and it was quite significant, the difference between, say, the US and, and the UK and, and other countries. And I don't know whether there's anything there in, in the way, the different ways that Pure is used in the US and, and North America than elsewhere, maybe in the UK, Europe or whatever, which um, is something that can be explored or, or maybe d delved into more. Um, because I was really, I was quite shocked by that. I was really quite, well, shocked, surprised by that. Um, particularly as I thought from my colleagues, <laughs> <laughs> that in the US, um, well, it, it, I suppose it's a matter of how much individual users are using it compared to administrators. And um, I don't know whether those figures were indicating that more individual users are using it than administrators. What I was surprised about was the raw numbers were so low in the US. And I, why? Why is that? You have, yes. <laughs> actually is part, uh, a question that we had on the survey that we weren't able really to do anything with. I think when I saw that slide, my thought was it's because at the, in the U.S. so many of our institutions, there's one of us or one or two of us who are administrators as part of our job, and that's it. We don't have a bunch of people fulfilling that role and a lot of people involved. So I think that might be part, part of it. And we had actually asked a question about FTE, about how many people do you have involved in this. And in the end, the, the data that we got back, we just weren't able to really do anything with it. So I, I think we'll look at perhaps a way of, of looking at that. Oh. Actually, we do cover that in the report. Oh, it is in the report? Yeah, okay, I, yeah. All right. That was the section I ended up with. Um, yeah, we do talk about that, and we do, you know, the way we asked the question made it sort of more harder for us to extrapolate from, but we do find numbers to support that the staffing in the U.S., as you say, is lower. And so I think that often our, you know, our, our institutional commitment is lower, and I think often we're sort of setting up systems, and then, because we're also, I think also because we're not using them for reporting, um, we aren't really needing researchers to sort of engage. I, I call this good enough data, uh, because if you're using it for expert discovery, it's good enough, because we're not necessarily using it for reporting. Yeah. 